The Real Ghostbusters is a very important show to me. It was actually my first favorite show growing up and helped turn me into the well-adjusted human being I am today, who's strange, weird, eccentric, sick. That about covers it. Having watched through this entire series again, it really stood out to me how well written it was at first, and it really made me glad I had shows like this while growing up. The real Ghostbusters can be separated into two parts, the original high-quality part and the post-ABC interference part. So first off, I want to talk about the version of the show that made me such a huge Ghostbusters fan. Yes, I was a fan of this series before the movie even. Probably had a little to do with the fact I'd seen real Ghostbusters first. Also, I was three and probably more into cartoons at the time. And that's, of course, not to say that the real Ghostbusters is inferior to the films. It's not. It actually stands the test of time very well because of the writing. The show was primarily written as a continuation of the movie, and pretty much any of the good scripts in the show had the same excellent blend of horror and comedy. Now, having watched this show about as young as you're likely to remember... In fact, watching real Ghostbusters is the earliest memory of watching something I have. I think I can say that it worked pretty much perfectly with how it wasn't dumbed down for kids. Now, they definitely had some jokes in there that went over my head at the time, but that never affected my enjoyment of it. And that's really what makes the show still very enjoyable to watch today. Ghostbusters, we, we weren't aiming at the kids, we were aiming at, you know, teenagers through whatever age. We just did what, what we thought was funny. All right, so one of the first things to get into with the show, I suppose, would be why it's called The Real Ghostbusters instead of just Ghostbusters like the movie. This actually goes back to 1975 when Filmation made a live action series called The Ghostbusters, which actually almost caused the Ghostbusters film to have to be called something else. Columbia suggested we change it. So we thought of calling it Ghost Breakers. We couldn't come up with another good title. At one point, we had 300 extras on the street, all yelling, Ghost Breakers, and then we'd say, okay, now you have Ghost Busters. And I said, we can't do this, and got the legal department and said, look, you gotta do something about this. They paid Filmation some money to use it in the movie, but the deal was that either of them could use the title in a TV show. So with Filmation still able to use the name themselves in this deal, and after the movie's big success, they decide to revive their Ghostbusters as a cartoon show. And they did so just ever so slightly before the cartoon based on the movie. Also note, they were now spelling Ghostbusters as one word and dropped the the. Yeah, Filmation obviously knew what they were doing. This caused a need to separate their Ghostbusters cartoon from the Filmation one, so kind of as a jab to them, the title The Real Ghostbusters was formed. No, ma'am. This is The Real Ghostbusters. This also ended up giving a nice distinction between the cartoon's universe and the movies because, well, there were some noticeable differences. One of the main things being that the characters' designs have all been tweaked. Now, there was never any dispute about the likenesses of the actors from the movie, but they decided to change them up to avoid anything or having to pay for them. I'm going to turn over the next card, and I want you to tell me what it is. You know... He doesn't look a thing like me. Some changes were also done just to make the characters stand out more in long shots, like giving them all distinctive hair colors and, of course, the different colored jumpsuits. Things like this were a later decision, too. As you can see in the pitch pilot made to sell the show, they all still had the same jumpsuits from the movie. Though, in an amazing nod to continuity and really part of the testament of how good this show was, they actually had an episode, Citizen Ghost, explaining why this happened. Okay, Egon, I'll bite. What's the first thing we have to do? Get rid of our uniforms. 
They absorbed a frightening amount of psychokinetic energy during our battle with Gozer. They'll have to be destroyed. In the pitch pilot, one of the other more noticeable things is Peter looks slightly more Bill Murray-ish. It's like in between him and his final real Ghostbusters design, which made him more muscular and gave him much bigger hair. Speaking of hair, though, it's Egon! So, even though Harold Ramis rocked a pretty amazing do in the Ghostbusters film, cartoon Egon had an even more amazing 80s hairstyle going on. But for the most part, I'd say Egon was the one who looked the closest to his real-life counterpart, just with blonde hair instead. Now, Ray, well, got a little bit chubbier. I'm definitely the fat one, I know that. Though they did end up slimming him down later on, I actually liked the fatter design better. It kind of went with his extremely happy-go-lucky personality. Also, it was just a trait that kind of made Ray stand out a little bit more from the other three. Winston got a shave, much like he would in Ghostbusters 2, and while he doesn't have very many extreme changes going on, he definitely doesn't resemble Ernie Hudson here. Janine, however, did get some major changes, and really all of them were for the best. Even though her sharp glasses scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. Janine has some amazing hair going on as well, and her character design was, well... Can I say sexy in a children's cartoon? I think sure. so. Can I say sexy forward. in a boxed set of a children's cartoon? <laughs> and Slimer, of course, was changed around to look less grotesque and more friendly since he is being changed into the sort of pet of the Ghostbusters. This was also something that was a bit of a later decision, as you can see a not-as-nice version of cartoon Slimer in the pitch pilot. But even though everyone had these cosmetic changes, their characters were very much kept intact thanks to the writing and the very talented voice cast. Everybody could improvise. That was a really important part. They, they could just take Joe's stuff and deliver it, and then every once in a while, add to it, and it was a joy to do. You, know, you, you were saying earlier that when we had the voice recording sessions, the actors would be given opportunities to, you know, to add a line or two or, or, or a joke along the way and make it, make it funnier. Lorenzo Music was Peter Venkman, and I really can't think of a more perfect choice to have done the cartoon version of this character. He really had the dry, sarcastic wit and the doofy charm the character should have. Now if you'll just hold still, Slimer, this won't hurt a bit. Are you sure this won't hurt him? Absolutely, Ray. Oh, well then, forget it. I'm leaving. I don't ever want to be touched by anyone ever again. <laughs> Do it and die all over again, Slimer. His version of Bankman is a little bit lower key than Murray's, but it really still captured the most important aspects of the character. So it's a slightly different take, but everything about it still says Peter Bankman. Now, of course, Lorenzo Music's voice is probably best known for Garfield, which was another match made in lasagna heaven, and Lorenzo Music did raise his energy for Venkman versus Garfield. Have no fear, Dr. Venkman and his staff are here. This is not fun! I've had fun! This isn't it! Ah! If anyone else has any other good ideas, please don't share them. I actually loved this version of Peter Venkman so much, I said I wanted to be him when I grew up. Of course, as I got a bit older, I realized I couldn't be him, so my expectations grew a bit more realistic, and I just wanted to be a Ghostbuster. I think one of the reasons I gravitate towards this character is I can sort of relate to Peter. I mean, he's sarcastic, which, you know, I am too, sometimes, sort of. He's a cynic, and there's even a kind of underlying depression that he uses humor to cope with. Which is why it pisses me off so much to see that stupid thing parading around in his skin once the show changed. I'll talk more about the Dave Coulier 
shitty version once we get to the changes forced upon the show, but suffice it to say, those layers to the character were removed, and the only thing left, really, was a stupid loudmouth moron. When Dave Coulier came in, I, I thought it was a loss, because I thought Lendl did such, did such a great job on it. He created the Bob Newhart show. He created the Rota show. He was, a, he was an established comedy writer, Emmy-winning comedy writer. Okay, let's move. I want to get back in time to watch a Bob Newhart show. I said to him, why are you doing this? Why are you doing voiceovers when you had the power of being a producer in, in Hollywood? He goes, what kind of power? Somebody would come in and say, does Rhoda wear the red dress or the blue dress in this episode? And I'd say, the blue dress. Some power. I have a lot more power doing this because I have the power to control my performance. I think that right there says a lot about Lorenzo Music and why he's so enjoyable to listen to. His delivery on lines is really what adds the extra punch to them, so it really makes sense to hear he cared about the art that much. I have to go after that thing. Right, before it hurts any patients. Besides, it'll eat Slimer if we don't. Well, we don't actually have to hurry. If anybody couldn't make it, we all got good enough for doing each other's voices that once in a while we'd throw There was one, for instance, one time Lorenzo couldn't make it, so we all took turns playing Lorenzo. And I think Frank Wilker did the best Lorenzo, but I came in second. And that was okay. Well, personally, I like Maurice LaMarche's Lorenzo a little bit more than Frank's based on the Garfield show, but still, it's kind of hard hearing anyone else do Garfield's voice. However, Maurice LaMarche and Frank Welker are probably the best in the world at pulling it off. Now, as for Egon, I really can't imagine anyone other than Maurice LaMarche voicing him. He's probably the only other person in the world besides Harold Ramis who would really nail this character. Maurice LaMarche just really seems to get what makes Egon tick, which is part of what makes him so good at playing the character. An afternoon at the ballpark would do you some good. Yeah, like fungus on the brain would do me good. Did somebody mention fungus? Egon, what now? As long as we don't disappear, we'll be all right. And while I loved Harold Ramis's take on the character too, I mean, of course he originated it, I think I like Maurice LaMarche's Egon just a little bit more. The Ghostbusters ride. Egon, can they do that? I think our trademark is being infringed. Look! Well, I've seen enough. They said, stay away from impressions. Whatever you do, no impressions, okay? My background was stand-up comedy and as an impressionist. Uh, so I sat there going, you know, it's like telling me, you know, telling, telling me not to breathe, uh, you know, to not do an impression. And I could not see any other way to do Egon except for doing Ramus. It really is hard to imagine Egon being performed in a very different fashion than Ramus's, so whatever their deal was against impressions is probably lucky for the show that Maurice LaMarche decided to just do it anyway. Oh, Egon, you're such a genius. Yes. I know. Maurice LaMarche really is one of the most talented voiceover artists and impressionists in the business, so he got to do a lot of other characters in the show as well, and you usually didn't know they were him. It was not unusual for Frank and I, being the multiple voice guys, uh, to, to play you know, five characters each, six characters each. The show really was lucky to have two voice actors in the main cast that were so good at additional voices like this, as they did tend to use them for it quite a bit. One of the kind of unfortunate reasons for this being, though, at the time, they didn't actually have to pay them anything extra for a couple additional voices. Now, one of the great things about the real Ghostbusters show is it's able to expand certain things that were starred in the movie, like like when they hinted at a relationship between Egon and Janine. It was always great having Janine's affection played off the very deadpan Egon, and they even went on some dates during the show. The show's over so I can confess my feelings to you. Did you really feel that way? I, I felt deeply, deeply affectionate towards you. I knew Can't it. you tell? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling deep affection right now. 
so this made it feel particularly wrong when they had the Janine and Lewis thing going on during the second movie. A lot of the time with Egon was even though he'd be very flat in his delivery about a lot of events, it wasn't that he didn't feel emotion, it's just that he didn't express it a lot. I just want you to know that I'm having a wonderful time. It didn't come across as deadpan as it should, but in the studio when we did it, you know, Arsenio, uh, as, as Winston goes, Egon, you enjoying yourself? And I, I would go, I'm having a wonderful time. And I was so deadpan, we both cracked up because the idea behind that is he's telling the truth. This is him having a wonderful time. Maurice LaMarche was the one who stayed with the series the longest, voicing Egon all the way to extreme Ghostbusters. The one who stayed the second longest and the only other main cast member to stay during the whole real Ghostbusters run was Frank Welker as Ray Stance. And he really captured the over-eager enthusiasm of the character. This is great! We've got a classic haunting here. It's like the whole place itself is becoming evil, coming alive. Boy, this is great. I love a man who enjoys his work. Ray helped to balance things out with his positive attitude against the other guy's cynicism or even just lighten up someone's more realistic look at the situations. And even though he was the fun-loving character of the group, he is also the second smartest next to Egon. Oh no, now what's wrong? What are we gonna do, Ray? We're gonna fix it. <laughs> While the overall show itself was still smart, I mean. Winston Zedmore was played by Arsenio Hall originally. Arsenio was waiting to go in, sat with him and chatted for a minute, and someone had gone and I hadn't noticed who. He came out and it was Ernie Hudson, who had played Winston in the movie. So as, Winst as, as Arsenio and I were talking, he'd come out and they called for Arsenio and he turned back and he looked at me and went, because he thought, I'm going up against the guy who played in the movie. This has got to be some kind of formality. Lo and behold, Arsenio got the job. This was certainly a weird situation. Apparently, Ernie Hudson was given the impression he basically had the role and coming down to audition really was just a formality. Then, he was rather surprised when he found out his character went to someone else. That said, Arsenio Hall did a great job with Winston. He was still the realist and the most down-to-earth of the Ghostbusters team. Dr. Venkman, Dr. Spin. Dr. Spengler, Dr. Spengler, Dr. Stance, Dr. Zedmore, Dr. Spengler. But I'm not a... Shh, I'm on a roll. Certain elemental imbalances have asserted themselves. In other words, you don't have to answer. Precisely. One of the particularly funny things about Winston in this series was, as the most grounded of the four main Ghostbusters, he usually wasn't very over the top, but every once in a while he'd pop out with a louder line and it'd be great. Oh yeah, how sweet it is! There's always been the kind of annoying thing of Winston kind of getting excluded or not as much focus put on him as the other three Ghostbusters, but the original version of the show gave Winston pretty much the same focus and a lot of stories that would center on him. What is that parallelogram thing anyway? An area of extreme psychic turbulence and dangerous cross-rip convergences. I can't believe anybody would want to go there. I would. Yeah, I figured you would. Locked. Unlocked. They're shooting at us! Figured that out, did you? Unfortunately, it didn't really stay that way through the entire run of the show. Arsenio stayed on for one season after a lot of the changes had happened, but then ended up hitting it big with getting his talk show, and he didn't quite have the same amount of time to do the cartoon anymore, and Buster Jones took over the voice. Guys, this is Winston. Do you read? Over! Take it easy, Slimer. We'll get him back. Buster Jones as Winston, while not being really bad or anything, wasn't quite the same, and it sounded slightly too old for Winston. The other problem, which certainly wasn't Jones's fault, was he never got the same funny moments like he used to. Now I can say for certain for me, and I think a lot of people, that Laura Summers' Janine Melnitz is the definitive version of the character. The look and attitude were perfect, and it helped, of course, that the show had more opportunities to give Janine more times to shine than the movie did. 
Ah! This had better be good, Janine. Slimer brought back this. Ray's in trouble. And if you're not downstairs and ready to go in five minutes, you're fired! She was smart and witty and would usually be the one to cut the Ghostbusters down if they're getting a bit too silly about something or getting a little full of themselves. How about some coffee, Janine? No thanks. Come along, Mrs. Favisham. I'll show you where they figure out new ways to do stupid things. Janine was a strong character, which was really nice to see. In fact, she almost never got captured or had to play damsel in distress, which was something all too commonplace. There was actually a few times where the opposite happened and it was up to Janine to save the rest of the group. And she even got to be a Ghostbuster herself quite a few times. Janine! Get out while you still can. Nothing doing. We're here to rescue you. Listen, Proteus is one of the primal gods, like Gozer. Oh, yeah, and Janine even thwarted a god once. And it was really good that even though there was the romantic plot between her and Egon, it was never her defining trait as a character. Egon probably left it there. I love that boy. But he'd forget his head if it wasn't welded to his collarbone. The green ghost from the hotel, of course, got his name here. And even though they never actually call him it in the movie, most people would just refer to him as Slimer. And then he is a character in the sequel, Ghostbusters 2, because of the cartoon show. I doubt that he would have reappeared if there weren't the cartoon of the toys. Slimer was, unsurprisingly, Frank Welker's second character to voice on the show, as he's pretty much the best at doing a lot of non-human type characters. And he almost made Slimer like one of the voices he does for Gremlins. Was that right? We had to pull him off Gremlins all the time. It's pretty funny because you can definitely still hear the Gremlins' influence on Slimer's voice in the earlier episodes. I think it's rabid. Huh? The cartoon even explained the path from him terrorizing at the hotel to him ending up as their kind of pet. After the containment unit was shut down and all the ghosts blew out, and after the battle with Gozer, Slimer started hanging around the firehouse. And Egon, wanting to examine a more willing ghost subject up close, wanted to keep him around. Now Slimer's main thing, of course, is that he loves eating or sliming Peter, which of course led to conflict with him. <laughs> Slimer! Peter, wait! Just let me blast them once! Is that really too much to ask? It was this conflict with Peter that really made the Slimer scenes work. And then you'd have this angrier reaction towards Slimer offset by someone like Ray or Janine's kinder attitude towards him. Oh, Peter, take it easy. I'll discipline Slimer. For shame, Slimer. You've been a naughty ghosty. And even though Peter was constantly threatening to bust him, they still showed he did care about Slimer once in a while without overdoing it and just turning him into another Ray. Surrender your weapons, or I shall be forced to do something unfortunate to your friend. Nobody picks on the spud but me, got it? When you write a show with a guy named Slimer, there are times you want to just hit him really, really hard a lot because you can, essentially. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to send him out into the world, have him get a job, do something worthwhile with his life or his death, as you wish, and put him in a situation where I can just beat the bejesus out of him endlessly. So my joy was his grief. Slimer usually just spouted nonsense, but with a few words sprinkled in so he got the gist. Well, in the original version, later he just wouldn't shut up. But originally, this made it funny when either Ray or Janine would manage to understand him. Well, I ain't got no one that fit, girl. Mommy ain't got no that fit, and I want to have no one that fit, girl. Whoa, hey, let me get this straight. You say Victor put you in there? It also made it extra funny when he did actually spout out a full phrase. Ah. 
Yes, Slimer just yelled, Oh my god! This was a syndicated episode, but I'm still guessing this passed by some people because of Slimer's usual nonsensical words. It's really interesting to watch this show back and see how much time they really did spend on the characters and how much deeper that makes the entire show itself. And with the far worse episodes in the other seasons, it really highlights how much more shallow the show had become. So we uh, always recorded together as a cast. If we can trap and contain the Ghostmaster, the force field will vanish. That's a big if, Egon. According to Who's Who in the Spirit World, the Ghostmaster rates as a class 11. 11? Right. Even if we could use our traps and throwers, we could never hold him. The fact they did the recordings together like this really shows, and I think you did get more of a group feel with the characters, which likely would have been missing had they all recorded their lines separately. It also led to some improv lines that helped punch up an episode, though it seems there is a lot of improving that most certainly would not ever make an episode. Our biggest nightmare was always having Maurice LaMarche, Lorenzo Music, and Frank Walker sitting next to each other because it was like the kids in class who never wanted to have sit together in the same row, this chaos would ensue. The humor got very, uh, as I said, we had a lot of bathroom humor, a lot of, uh, a lot of fart sounds. <laughs> Gosh, it's just really hard to, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm hard pressed to think of anything that I could repeat for you. If anyone kept a reel of the outtakes, they were, you know, I guess we don't want to say it on this, but boy, they get pretty risque. It, it, between takes, if they had to improvise, it would turn into a friar's roast, doing those characters. Because it wouldn't put them in booths. There was like one big room, you have all the actors sitting side by side with each other in this room, riffing off of each other. And sometimes it got really very funny. And, and things that were not in the episode were often the funniest of all because they'd be you know, riffing off of each other and, and extemporizing and uh, improving things that were far too rude to ever end up in a cartoon episode. I really wish I could hear these recording sessions so bad, and they just keep teasing me with it on the DVD set. When a cast actually likes each other, a lot of the time it'll bring up the performance level, and it really seems there was a family feel with the cast on the real Ghostbusters. Working with Lorenzo music was just so great, and um, he was taught me how to play the ukulele, and um, for real, <laughs> for real, not in the cartoon, and he was just so generous and sweet. Lorenzo protected his face. He thought that gave him a certain mystique, and he was right. His headshot was him eating a gigantic hamburger with a pair of reflective sunglasses on and a beret. And you had absolutely no sense of what the man's face looked like. He was one of the kindest, sweetest men. And I remember after that first season, he had us all over to his beautiful home uh, for a Christmas dinner. You have, you have, you know, cast you know, cast friends, but you know, your friends on the show and then you go your separate ways, but he actually uh, made it a family. I really love hearing stories like this and hearing about how voice actors would do these things and help each other out. Another thing I'm sure really helped elevate the performances was the script editor and writer for a lot of the standout episodes of the series, Joe Straczynski, would go to pretty much all the recording sessions. It was not considered pro forma back when I was working on Ghostbusters for the story editor to go to recording sessions. It was just like, why are you here? But because the show was so character-oriented, because oftentimes the humor was very specific and the references were very oblique, someone had to be able to explain to the actors what this means and to work with them on character. Uh, a lot of animated shows at that time were very superficial character-wise. They were just, you know, run and jumps for the most part. But these dug down deep into the characters. The fact Joe Straczynski would go out and do that really shows the care he had for this series. And without a doubt, he is one of the main reasons the show had the quality it did. Of the 78 that were done that first year, I probably saw three, 400 pitches and premises that came in. Um, for every writer that came in with 10 premises, I pick up one. And that was a high rate of attrition. I 
put a very high standard on Ghostbusters as far as the kind of stories we would tell. This really shows considering how few duds I think there were in the original run of the series. And you have an easy comparison when you can look at the rest of the series where Straczynski had left being story editor. So, as mentioned, Straczynski wrote some of the best episodes of the show, like when Halloween was forever, Citizen Ghost, and Take Two. And even if something had a kind of stupid sounding premise, he would actually make it work, like for example, doing a story involving chickens. After I turned in the script for Chicken, he clocked, which was a little bit demented. Joe Metcher called me on the phone and said, uh, are you okay? I said, yeah, why? Well, we read Chicken, he clocked, and we think you're a little disturbed, and maybe you need to have a weekend off. Should I take it out? Nope, we love it. We just we just worried about you. In Chicken He Clucked, the fact the plot is revolving around chickens and that being a stupid thing is a plot point. There's a guy who's driven mad because he lives next to a chicken shop and he gets so sick of them he summons a demon to make them disappear off the face of the planet. The demon becomes a laughing stock for having to grant such a stupid wish and ends up aiding the Ghostbusters so he can reverse it and try to get some dignity back. You compare this to the post-ABC interference episode Poultry Geist, where the premise is where chickens that are just a kind of matter-of-fact thing that exist, and instead of the episode and characters being in on the fact that it's a stupid plot, it instead feels like it's insulting your intelligence. This is just a good example of how you can approach a similar subject, and depending on the writing, it can either still be an interesting plot with good humor, or just something kind of embarrassing. Another strength of the series was, naturally, the strong ties it kept to the movie. As mentioned earlier, they actually explain the series of events that led to some of the changes the Ghostbusters had in the cartoon versus the movie. This came in just before you went up to fight Gozer. It's your new uniforms! The second order of business is to rebuild the containment grid so we'll have some place to put the ghosts. Whoa. This time I think I'll make it bigger. I love so much that they even have touches like this to explain that. It's another thing that really shows how much they didn't want to try and write this show down for children. And I can say I appreciated that as a kid, and I appreciated it even more now. And even though the events of the movie happened within the real Ghostbusters universe, the episode Take Two actually involved the film's production. Murray, Aykroyd, and Ramos? Was that a law firm? So it happened, and then the movie was the sort of biopic showing these events. Another reason which helped the show keep such strong ties to the movie was the fact that Joe Medjek and Michael C. Gross, two of the producers from the original movie, were also executive producers on the cartoon. So they knew what they were doing when it came to Ghostbusters, obviously, and they also gave Straczynski a lot of freedom with the writing. The show would also come up with a lot of different ways the Ghostbusters had to solve problems rather than just always coming in with their proton streams and capturing a ghost in a trap. They had to deal with things like possession, vampires, werewolves, trolls, imps. Hell, they even had to battle Cthulhu in an episode. The designs of some of these ghosts and creatures would get pretty creepy too. What also added a lot of depth was sometimes the ghosts in the show weren't even bad. Some of them actually just came back to right a wrong made in life or say goodbye to a loved one. I wasn't looking for a thing. I was looking for you. I just, I just wanted to tell you that I love you. One last time. Casey Jones was an engineer. He died in a train wreck. So I figured his ghost wouldn't rest until he'd set things right. By preventing a train wreck, he wanted to save someone's life, not take it. Now, during the original run, there were episodes produced for the first season on ABC, and the other ones were produced for a syndication package. With the syndicated episodes not having to go through the OK from the network and not specifically being for Saturday morning, they were able to do a bit more so you could have creepier designs for some of the ghosts or creatures. And super creepy Peter hitting on more women. Yeah, definitely too extreme for Saturday mornings. The primary difference between the two 
was the presence of broadcast standards and practices or BSP or just BS. I'm just really, really thankful there was also the syndicated package because I can't imagine if we had only had the one ABC season of good episodes because that was only 13 of them. They made a whopping 65 for syndication, giving the series 78 quality episodes versus the 62 post-ABC interference ones. It made it so there were still good episodes playing well after the changes had happened to the show, which made them easier to ignore since you could always get to flip back to the quality ones. Not saying I didn't notice because I did and it made me sad. I always hated the wrong sounding Peter episodes and it made me miserable to revisit them. The thing you can get after the original version of the show the most for, though, is the animation at times. There were quite often goofs like their clothing magically changing in a shot, them having the wrong hair color or the wrong jumpsuit color, and the more extreme ones like Egon deciding to walk away from himself or White Winston. I have seen shit that'll turn you white. Also, noticeable in the syndicated episodes where there was less money for the animation, there'd also be a little less movement and sometimes kind of awkward pauses between lines. The Lord of Evil. Yeah, but I'll bet he can't dance to save his soul. But those are all pretty minor problems, and I'll accept those all day for something with that and a good script versus something with pretty animation that's brain dead. That said, I actually prefer the overall look of the series earlier on versus the later seasons. It has a kind of anime vibe to it, which makes a lot of sense as a lot of artists working on the storyboards were being influenced by anime at the time. And sometimes the show even has extreme anime moments which were pretty funny to see in something like Ghostbusters. Oh, Peter! Help! Oh, please help! But the real version of the real Ghostbusters really stands the test of time. It's still very clever writing for the most part and makes me laugh out loud quite often. The second incarnation of the real Ghostbusters got maybe a few chuckles out of me, but for the most part, the magic was gone. So next time, we'll talk about the show this became after the network decided to mess everything up. Slap! and the real Ghostbusters. But please, if you're going to watch a show for something actually good, just watch the first ABC season and the syndicated episodes. I can't recommend those highly enough. The stuff that came after is really not even the same show. <laughs> Isn't it a bit strange for a bunch of Ghostbusters to have a ghost living with them? Strange, weird, eccentric, sick, that about covers it.